Hey. How's everyone doing? It's good to be with you this morning. We're excited to worship and hopefully you have caught wind of this. We're going to stay for a little congregational meeting. I know it's like fair weekend. All our fair people are getting their stuff back this week. I know it's a busy summer vacation weekend. Um, note to self, if you ever do a building campaign again, don't start it in the summer. I've, I've learned this. You learn things along the way. Um, but I hope you do stay. So we're going to start about five minutes after worship. We're going to tear down after the meeting. So just go to the bathroom, get a drink. We're going to bring the kids down so you don't have to go back up and get them because we really want to hear from as many people as possible. All right. So let's stand and get ready to worship. Come Holy Spirit, pray that you fill us afresh this morning with your goodness, with your compassion for the lost. God, we need you. I pray this morning that you would remind us of how good you are, that you give us wisdom and that you draw hearts to you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship. Amen. So I, I got um, Psalm 22, 22 this morning. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of you descendants of Jacob, Glorify him and fear him, all of you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. And truly, um, he has done everything for us, and we can worship him because of all he did for us. Amen? And we're in we're to do that with all of our brothers and sisters across the globe this morning.
graves into gardens. Amen. Ashes into beauty because only he can.
soft like snow. The sun forbid to. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done for us. Thank you that our chains are gone because we've been set free by what you've done for us on the cross. We bless you this morning. We praise you. We give you all honor and all glory and all praise. And we recognize we can do nothing without you, Jesus. Bless this message and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Can be dismissed. I hear there are snow cones today. Yeah, that's right. Big kids going too, huh? I had to tell the teachers to make sure they get to the snow cones early because the preacher's going to try to keep the sermon short today. Cross your fingers, but that's the goal. A couple quick announcements while we're getting ready. Um, Bridge Fest, this Friday, so Bridge Fest is a two-day event. We are going to be participating in the Friday night Bridge Fest. It's on Center Street. It's the family kind of oriented one. We've done this a number of years. I think Brunella and Sam gave out like 400 plus snow cones last year. Fortunately this year, they're not alone. We have a sign-up sheet. Some of you have signed up to help out. Um, but one of the cool things we're going to do this year is we're going to set up a little table next to our snow cone thing and just say prayer if you need it and just offer prayer and just see what happens. We're going to see what the Holy Spirit does. So if you want to pray for folks or you want to just be there or you're out at Bridge Fest, say hi, get a snow cone. But it's a great way. Tons of people in the community come out. That's this Friday. And then again, some of you came in a little bit later. Just a reminder, we have a meeting right after worship. And I'm talking like five-minute gap. Just enough to get some coffee, snag any food that's left so you're not hangry. We're not going long. I'm trying to keep everyone from being hangry during this meeting. That's never good. Um, and we're going to get right to it. Kids are coming down. You don't have to go get them today. I think that's all. Oh, wait. So we had, we had a calendar that's going around. Now, I put the wrong date on the calendar. I own that. I can't figure out dates, apparently. The last Sunday in August, I think it's like the 26th or 7th. See, look how bad I am. Um, I think we're going to. It's tentative, but it looks like it will happen two weeks from now. We're going to have an outdoor service up here in the grass, right up here under the trees in the shade. And uh, we'll do a potluck afterward. And the kids will have their classes, but then they can join us for the potluck. It should be fun. Bring a lawn chair. Um, but we'll be able to keep it on site so if someone comes for the first time, they won't miss OCV because we're like, see, we're at the park. We'll be up there, okay? God, we are your people. And we, we just consecrate ourselves again this morning to you. I'm reminded of Paul's word that we're living sacrifices, and Lord, we just offer ourselves and our hopes and our ambitions and our pains and our sorrows to you. Knowing that you are gentle and lowly of heart and that you have room for all who are heavy laden and you can give us rest. And Lord, we pray for this church. We pray that you give us wisdom. We pray for the meeting that's coming after. We pray for the decisions to be made in the coming days and weeks. But Lord, we also pray for every church in our town. Lord, we pray for our Catholic brothers and sisters and all the decisions being made around parishes and buildings and all of that. We pray for our United Methodist brothers and sisters and all the decisions being made 
and our global Methodist brothers and sisters. We pray that every church in this town this morning would feel your presence in a way that captivates our hearts and that draws hearts far from you, close to you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that for folks who are bringing in hurts and pains and sin and brokenness this morning, that you would do what you do best. You draw them to you. You remind them of hope. And we give it all to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I thought we were done with this Unlimited series last week, and then as I prayed and prayed, and for a preacher, once in a while, you get those weeks where you're like, or between sermon series, I honestly don't know, God. Do you have any ideas, right? Because I, I wasn't sure, but you know, I kept thinking about all this going on in the life of our church, and I realized I felt very limited, even in my ability to make wise decisions, especially when they're big ones, and I realized this week we're doing another one on Unlimited because when it comes to decisions, if you've ever had a big one, sometimes you realize how finite your ability to see all the angles and think of all the things actually is. So the sermon today is titled Decisions, Decisions, Essentials of Dis Biblical Decision Making. So this applies to our conversation after church, but it also applies to decisions you're making in your life, decisions in your family that are being made. So it's a timely sermon, and it's a sermon that reminds us how limited we are. You know, God can see every possible outcome. I sometimes can't even see the main one. So how do we make, think about decisions in light of Scripture? I've been thinking about this a lot, desiring more wisdom, and the Bible fortunately tells us if you want wisdom, pray for it. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask and God will give it. In James, he tells us that. So I'm saying, God, give us wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give us wisdom. Give our board wisdom. That should be our prayer. No matter what decision you have in your life, always ask God for wisdom. He says he'll give it. So I've been praying for wisdom in relation to, obviously, the building and all that's going on, right? Many of you know, hopefully most of you know by now, we're looking seriously at pursuing a building, the Lee Bessler Hall. We have architectural drawings. We have also an estimate of price. And there's lots of considerations. So I've been praying for wisdom. The other thing I've been praying for wisdom for, and for some of you this is like old news, and for some of you this will be the first time you heard it, and you'll be like, wait, what? Um, so if you were at our family meeting, we have those every January, after service, up there, talk through our budget, talk through life of our church. One of the things I talked about at our last family meeting is, many of you know I've been working at Grove City. Well, last January, the it, we, we applied for a grant, and the team I'm on said, we think, Charlie, you need to be the lead writer on this grant, and if you get it, you're going to be the executive director of a center for rural ministry. So we're going from the project in rural ministry to the center for rural ministry. Well, lo and behold, we got the grant. In fact, it was about a month after we started looking in the building, we found out we got the grant. So I've been trying to do a lot of decision making in my own life around what's it look like balancing OCV and this. Because part of it, too, is I'm, I'm going to be a faculty member. So there's a lot going on. And basically, we're going to have to hire an associate pastor. So that's just priming the pump for conversations later today. But I just want you to know that. So that I've been thinking through a lot of decisions myself. So this has all been running through my mind and Amy's mind and the board's mind. They've been on board the whole time, pun intended. Um, and you can see why we've been asking God for wisdom. So this is something we need to pray for even heading into this meeting today. I was thinking about it. We're seven years in, basically as of today. I said last week, but they weren't here to, here to hear it. We had one meeting in the summer of 2015 for OCD planning. And the only people still left, fortunately Amy's still left, and then Tom and Julie. They were at that meeting at Garrett and Autumn Heath's house back in 2015. That was the first OCD meeting. And then the next summer, we met. So we're now seven. So we are first graders. We're getting up there, right? Seven, you go to first grade, okay? So, I mean, we're making pretty big decisions for first graders. 
here, but we're a seven-year-old church. So how do we think about these decisions? There are two passages that I felt like God, as I prayed this week and really didn't know exactly what he had for us, I felt like he put these two on my heart. The first comes from Acts. Now, if you know the book of Acts, you know that in Acts there are a lot of big decisions because a lot's happening, right? Kingdom gains growing pains. I've said that a number of times. When a church grows, everyone's super excited, and then it's like, but wait, I don't know anyone anymore. Or like, we leave the transit, and it's like, oh, but it doesn't feel quite the same, right? Kingdom gains growing pains. Any season of growth in any church, there's going to be a lot of excitement. There's going to be some folks who feel like, ah, oh, something's off. It's not the same. This was happening in Acts. The church was growing by leaps and bounds. And in Acts 15, right about in the middle of the book, just about the middle, we have a major family meeting. It's called the Jerusalem Council. You see, before this, Peter, who's the rock on which Jesus is going to build his church, right? He has this experience where he sees a sheet descend three times, right? And it has all these unclean animals that no Jewish man would ever eat. And God says, take and eat. And then he says, go see Cornelius, a Gentile centurion, an agent of the Roman Empire. And and Cornelius and his whole family come to know Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, God, what are you doing? I thought this was for Jews. They didn't get circumcised the last I checked. But they're filled with your spirit. And he realizes God's doing something that's big. And then a few chapters after that, we get the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And where are they going? They're not just going to synagogues when they travel around the Mediterranean. They go to synagogues first. They usually get kicked out. And then they go to the Gentiles. And so by the time we get to Acts 15, the church has a big decision to make. And it's one full of emotion. Should we ask that Gentiles, by the way, last time I checked, 99.9% of us here are Gentiles, should we make them become Jewish first? Do they need to keep Torah? Do they need to give up shellfish? Do they need to fill in the blank? And the church has to decide. And there are people pretty fired up. So go ahead and look at Acts 15. We're going to read most of this chapter. We're going to start with 1 through 13. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. I love how the Bible puts it. They They had a little bit of a major argument. No little discussion and dissent. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about the question. The head of the church was still in Jerusalem. Peter's there. James, the brother of Jesus, is the head of the church by this point. And they're in Jerusalem. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia, Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's in chapter 10. That's the story of Cornelius. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul. 
as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So we see what's happening here. There's a, there's a controversy around what do you have to do to be saved? Do you have to become culturally Jewish for Jesus to save you or not? Peter stands up and he says, well, here's what God did. Here's what I saw. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up and they say, here's what we see the Holy Spirit doing. Here's what God did. But they have another party saying, wait a second, guys. Remember what the Torah said? We're not just throwing out the Torah, right? You can see the controversy. What do we do? What do we see? What can we learn about decision-making from this? Well, let's keep reading about how this high-pressure decision goes down. Verse 13, after they finished speaking, James replied, now he's the leader of the church, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited Gentiles, by the way, that's Peter, to take them from, from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it's written. And he's quoting from Amos here. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, James continues, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Basically the things that would make them unable to meet with their Jewish brothers and sisters. Like, don't do the things that would make you unable to meet with your Jewish brothers and sisters. Right? Don't do the things that would, that would cut off relationship. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So we've heard so far from Peter. We've heard from a group that opposes this movement. We've heard from um, Paul, Barnabas. Now we've heard from James. And then we get some group consensus here. In verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders and the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Bar Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. And here's a quote. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling to your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. Obviously, by the way, a different Judas. Okay. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Let me read that verse again. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you, do, if you keep yourselves from these things, you do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, that's the end of the letter, when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of the encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So what can we learn about this big decision as we think about decisions in our life and decisions in the life of our church? I think there's a number of things we can learn from this, but I want to highlight a few. The first thing I want to highlight is that leaders lead. Right? If, if you call yourself a leader and you look behind you and no one's there, you might not be a leader. You might be deranged. You, there might be a problem, right? If you're a leader, you lead. The leaders are leading here, right? A problem comes up, 
And Peter and James, they don't say, like, find someone to deal with this. I can't, th- I, I don't have the bandwidth for this today. No. They take on the problem and they step into it and they lead. And they do what? They lead from their own experience and from their practical wisdom. The things they, they have learned. Right? The wisdom that God has given them. I want to tell you, church, you have some good leaders here. Your board and the, even the people that we've had around this, this building project, the committee of folks that are kind of been thinking through it, there's some wise people. There's some good leaders in, as it pertains to this project, but also as it just pertains to the life of a church. So I hope you listen to them. And I hope you, you listen to their experience. And, and leaders, myself included, sometimes leaders just have to make decisions. You might not know everything. You might be like 80%, but there comes a time where you're like, we have to decide something. And guess who has to do it? A leader has to lead. And your family, by the way, hear this. You might be thinking, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not a leader. I'm not in the church. I show up sometimes. I drink some coffee. I listen to a sermon or two. Right? No. Virtually everyone here is a leader in some facet of your life. Your family, if you're a parent, you're a leader. Automatically. If you're a grandparent, you're still a leader. If you're a teacher, you're a leader. If you are a manager at work, you're a leader. If you're in a friend circle and people tend to look at you when a decision needs to be made, you're a leader. The question is, are you leading? Are you using the wisdom God gave you and the experience that he's let you have to make wise choices? You might not know every part of the decision, but at some point, a leader has to lead. But here's the other thing leaders have to do. They also have to listen. Do you notice what doesn't happen here? What doesn't happen here is, but what could easily happen, because you've probably experienced this, someone, you know, this little cohort of folks are like, oh, you know, they need to become Jewish and be circumcised. And the leaders are like, that's a crazy idea. Why don't you just leave? I don't want to listen to that. Have you ever had, like, something that you really care about and someone brings up an opposed point of view, and you're just like, no way. I'm not even giving that a time of day. Right? The leaders listen. They take it seriously. There's room for all the ranges of opinions in this discernment process in Acts, 20, Acts 15. The leaders lead, but they listen. They also listen to others. And guess who else they listen to? It seemed good to whom? To the Holy Spirit and to us. That's such a great way of phrasing it. It's so interesting. Like, the church, the congregation here in Jerusalem gets included in. Like, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. That's important. Leaders listen to the congregation. It seemed good to us. And it seemed good to whom? To the Holy Spirit. Part of being a leader in the church and part of being a Christian leader in your family or friend circle in your job is you actually can listen to folks and you also can listen to the Holy Spirit. Leaders lead, but leaders listen. Two ears, one mouth, right? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. They had to listen to what the Holy Spirit was saying and to us. The other thing we see happening in this discernment process is people use their gifts. People like Judas and Silas here, they're prophetic. They can encourage. One of the major uses of the prophetic in the life of God's people isn't to tell the future like some Nostradamus, but it's actually to encourage people by helping them be reminded how God thinks about them and how God thinks about the world. Right? May more prophets arise. They encourage the people. They speak truth to them. They use their gifts, just like Peter uses the gift of influence that he has, right? If you are like the boss, it doesn't help anyone if you're like, oh, I'm nobody. I'm not. No, no, you write the checks. You are somebody. You better use that leadership. It, this, that false humility doesn't help anyone. I'm just the pastor, no one listens to me. Well, I get a microphone for 45 minutes every week, and you guys are all very nice and you listen. I better actually own that. 
I have more weight of responsibility on me in front of the Lord. Whatever God's given you, whatever gifts, whether it's position, whether it's your job title, whether it's the fact you have kids that love you and listen to you, whether it's the fact that in your friend group everyone looks to you for advice, use it. Whether it's you know a lot about fill in the blank or you know a lot about fill in the blank. One of the things I love doing is building teams. And so when we were thinking about this building, one of the first things I want to do is just start thinking. And it's not, it's not like exhaustive and it's not finished about who knows some things. You know, who knows about fixing stuff? Well, if you have someone who fixed things for Sears for like decades in your congregation, you should probably have them involved, right? Like, there are these things, like if, if, if someone knows about dirt work and runs an excavating business, you should probably say, hey, maybe you want to give us some advice, right? I love doing that. And if you're like, well, I know some things you didn't ask me, I might not know you know things because I haven't gotten to know you yet. And we're not done. So we're taking volunteers, okay? So if you know some things, let me know. We want to get people involved. Because I know some things too, but I don't know the same things you know. We need a team. And that's one of the things I love about this is they're like, Peter, what do you know? But then they're like, Paul, Barnabas, what do you know? And then James comes in and he uses his authority. He says, this is what I know too. And by the way, when they're listening to the Holy Spirit, one way that we hear the Holy Spirit is through Scripture. This is where so many church discussions have a hard time because the people that are saying they have to be circumcised, they're like, we have the Torah, we have Scripture on our side. You see what James does. James says, let's just slow this train down a minute. Scripture has a lot of different things to say about the Gentiles. And if there's some room for Gentile inclusion in Scripture that the Holy Spirit has drawn my attention to right now in the middle of this conversation, we should heed that too. And so he quotes from what? Amos, from Scripture. So they listen to the Holy Spirit, they listen to Scripture. If you have a decision in your life, Hear me, church. If you have a decision in your life that is clearly against Scripture and you're like, I don't know what God wants me to do, I'm going to tell you, that's not a decision. That's sin. At that point, it's sin. It's not a decision. You don't have a decision to know what God wants you to do. You know what God wants you to do. The question is, will you listen to Him? They listened to the Holy Spirit and to Scripture and to the wisdom of the church. All of those things matter. If, the, if Scripture, if it doesn't align with Scripture, you can't hope to bring it around by the wisdom of the church and the Holy Spirit. You've got to start there. And then lastly, in this example, we see the church communicating clearly about what it was going to do. Now, you all, many of you are from a small town. You know how this works. Oh, OCB, they already bought the building. Oh, the Humane Society, they're kicking them out, kicking them to the curb. They don't like dogs, and I hear they don't like cats or any, I don't know if I like cats, but I have one. Right? You know how these things happen. The church communicated very clearly what they were going to do moving forward. It's important to actually let people know what's happening. And to have a concise, clear, and compassionate response, which is exactly what we see in Acts 15. Concise, clear, and compassionate. They don't say, do whatever you want, Jesus loves you. No, they say, here's some standards, but we have openness for you. So I think there's a lot as individuals and as a church we can gain from that passage. If you think any decision you're making in your life or any decision we make as a church has emotions around it, I'm telling you, this was a make or break. Like, take it, like, cage match. You know, like, what, Musk and, like, Zetterberg or whatever, or Zuckerberg are going to have a cage match? No, this is like the cage match, right? 
I can't even keep up. Twitter's not even Twitter anymore. I don't even know. I don't even know what's happening, right? In any event, bringing the plane back here, we see a lot that we can gain. Let's look at one more passage we'll call it a day. I'm watching the clock. I'm on a mission myself. We're going to keep this shorter than normal. It's really good that the clock's back there and not up here. This is a good placement. Another passage that I've found extremely helpful this week, and even over the years as I've thought about big decisions, comes out of the epistle of Peter, 1 Peter. So one of the biggest decisions our family's ever made happened about just over 10 years ago now when we were deciding, do we move away from family? Do we move away from a church job I loved to go to a new town six, seven hours away and start a PhD? And then the question even before that was, would I even get into any programs? I got into one. That's all you need, by the way, was one. I got into one, okay? And you know one of the verses that God used in that period of my life? Because I was like, you ever had those decisions that, you know, even pastors have this nerve-wracking point, like at night your heart is racing, maybe palpitations. I don't know what those feel like, but I think I might have had some. I'm not sure. But like some things happened in there that felt weird, and you can't sleep, and it's going. Like that was me at that season. Because I was like, I don't know. It's never going to happen. God, I feel like I'm supposed to. I don't know. Psalm 37 and 1 Peter 5 were two passages I just had to hold on to. Still huge passages for me. And it was interesting. Last week, we've been praying at 930 every Sunday for several, several weeks now, most of the summer. And last week, Diana Miklas brought up a little salty song. Some of you know the singing song book. I don't know how, like, I was in a play once where they put on this big book and we, they, they ran around with it. I don't know how that worked. But the singing song book, he has some songs that put scripture to memorable ways, right? And I can still sing them. We literally sing this song to our kids at night sometimes. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Right? That's what Salty told us to say. Right? But it's, it still sticks with us, and we sing that for our kids. And Diana brought that up last week, and it just stirred something in me because that passage was so powerful for me in that season of discernment. I thought, there might be something here for us. So this song is based on 1 Peter 5. And it's a passage that pretty clearly lays out two things, I think. The posture of decision-making. Right? We all know body language is a thing. If you've had a preteen, I'm starting to get some. It might be a thing, right? You can tell. Yes, Dad, but it's not yes, right? It's not. We, good thing we adults never use this, but body language is a thing. The posture we carry matters. So we see a posture of decision making, and we also catch a spiritual landscape, right? No decision happens in a vacuum. You don't just say, let me go to my deserted island for, for a week, and I'm going to make a decision, not think about anything else in my life, and then I'll come back. Nothing happens like that. You can take your retreat, but guess what? The rest of your stuff's going to be there when you get back. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Nothing happens in a spiritual vacuum. And in this passage, we see that there's a spiritual landscape out there that impacts us. What do I mean? Well, let's start at the beginning of 1 Peter 5. At first, you might think, well, this passage doesn't matter to me because I'm not a shepherd of the flock. Well, I, I have something else to tell you. Listen to the first part, and then we'll get to the second. So I exhort you elders among you, as a fellow elder, as a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherds appear, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So the first four verses are to people 
in positions like me and Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and small group leaders and anyone leading, shepherding anyone. It says, do a good job. Do it for the right reasons. Because guess what? The shepherd is coming. And he's going to pull all the little shepherds in. And you better be doing the right thing when he comes. But then he moves on from people in leadership to a much broader category. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And then he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your cares, all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. The posture of decision-making, the posture of, of interacting with each other is humility. This is the Christian posture. I'm reading a book which I would recommend called... Uh, gentle and lowly, and it's about the heart of Christ. Because there's only one point in the New Testament Jesus talks about his own heart. It's when he says in Matthew, come to me all you who are burdened and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Right? He's gentle and lowly of heart. Humility wasn't a virtue in Judaism. It wasn't a virtue in Greco-Roman society at all but it was a virtue in Christianity. Why? Because we follow a king who describes his heart as gentle and lowly. He is humble to the core. The one person who doesn't have to be is perfectly humble. Whenever we're leading, whenever we're making decisions, honestly, whatever we're doing, when we feel ourselves getting pulled off the rails of humility, we need to stop and think again. Humility is, is an essential part of Christian life and Christian decision making. As is trust in God. What's it say? Cast your cares on Him. The posture of our hearts in decision making is humility and trust. And those two things go together. It's hard to be trusting in someone if you're not humble knowing you need that person. And then the landscape. So the posture is humility and trust. This trust that we can cast our anxieties on Him and we can trust Him with Him because He cares for us. We're not hitting a brick wall. He actually cares for us. We're also not in a vacuum. There's a landscape within which all this happens and all this plays out. So right after it says, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you, we get this warning. Be sober-minded. Be awake. Don't be spiritually tipsy. Be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, little while the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the landscape. The landscape is less like a walk in the park and more like a storming of Normandy. We are on mission, church, and we are on mission in a place where there's an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, who seeks to use every decision to cause dissent and turmoil, who seeks to let pride run rampant. And that is a real reality of the world we live in. And the enemy doesn't say, I won't go in the church. I won't disrupt them. I'll wait till they come out. No. 
Sometimes we bring him right in with our own attitudes and our own sin. There is something at stake. There is a battle going on. These decisions are not just nice things to do. That's why we want you all to be involved. This is life and death. This Christian life. And the little decisions churches make, they're all part of it. We want to do the best job we can with the limited time and resources we have. So, three keys, and then I'll stop, and we'll have communion. Keys to biblical decision making. Humble and thoughtful, number one. Listen to each other. That's humility, by the way. Have grace for each other. There's going to be people in a church this size who disagree politically, who disagree probably in some theological stuff, who disagree about buildings, who disagree about you name it. Listen. Have grace. Bring our experiences. Bring your areas of expertise and knowledge. Y'all know things I don't know, and we need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. And bathe it in prayer. We can't say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us if we're saying, like, Holy Spirit, I have about two minutes. You can show up in this meeting right now. Okay, Holy Spirit, your time. Nothing? Okay, nothing? Okay, good. We're good. It seemed good to us to no, you got to bathe it in prayer. That's one. Humble and thoughtful. Biblically rooted and spirit led. Again, if something, decision you're making, goes against Scripture, you need to remember that first. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's not a decision to hold before the Lord if you know what the Bible says. The decision's already been made about the right and wrong. So are you willing to listen? And then three, trusting and vigilant. Part of humility is a posture of faith and trust in God. Do we actually believe that He cares for us like that verse says? Or do you feel like you cast your cares on Him and it's just an empty phone line up there and you don't know what's going on and you're doubting. Does He really even care? I'm here to tell you. He cares. And I didn't make that up. I got it from Scripture. And guess what? This passage of 1 Peter was written to support a church under persecution. Did you catch the bits about suffering there? Remember me talking about the guy in solitary confinement last week? The church is in persecution around the world today. The church has always been in persecution in places. And this book was written for them. So if anyone thought, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, or whoever, right? The answer is yes, and he cares. He really does. And it matters because the stakes are high. We have an enemy who's out there like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. That word doesn't get used too much in the Bible. One of the times it does is in Jonah when the whale just gulps him up. The enemy's real. He's active in the world. He wants to be active in the church if we let him. Humility is honestly the best way to fight him. I hope that's helpful to you. If you have decisions, if you need prayer, we will have still time for prayer during communion. If you just want prayer, maybe you can't even talk about decisions, but you want prayer, get prayer. And as we go to this meeting, please stay. We're going to have some activities for kids in the back. If you have little kids, stay. If you're a teenager, you're like, this doesn't matter to me. Guess what? It's good for you to hear this kind of stuff, right? You're maturing. You're growing up. This is like adult stuff that happens in the life of a family of God. You should stay, too. Dear God, help us. Holy Spirit, come. Give us greater humility. Give us greater insight. Convict us of sin. Give us hope that there's a way forward. And root us in you. From the youngest in this building to the oldest, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you're helping with communion, will you come forward?
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to one by one a group of guys who had all kinds of issues. But he loved them. And he prayed for them. And even Judas, he gave a chance that night to make the right decision. I hope every week you see this as an opportunity to decide well. This isn't a rote formula. This is a chance to decide week by week, will I receive Christ? Do I want Him? Will I come to Him in humility? You never outgrow that. We're always making that decision. This meal reminds us of it every week. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. This is God's meal for His people. Come humbly. Come in repentance if there's sin in your life. Let's take a minute. Just open our lives to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. As I was praying, I had this, this picture in my mind of this, and this phrase, this, this hound. Uh, so in the church, God has been described as the hound of heaven from time to time because he pursues us. And there might be some of you, I just had the sense there might be people here You've, you've been sending that signal up and you don't think God cares. You started running away. And I just want you to know the hound of heaven is pursuing you. He is pursuing you. And he will not stop because he loves you. You see, the enemy seeks to devour you. The hound of heaven, when he gets to you, it's an embrace. This is the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Come, eat in remembrance of him. failure you take our weakness you 
set your treasure in jars of clay. Take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see. Your sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. And I can May the God who brings back the broken to life. And God, we claim that. May he bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you. And may he give you peace. Church, you're on mission. This is a battlefield. You bring the light. Don't say yes to the darkness. God bless you this week. Get some coffee. If there's any food left, get some sustenance and come right back. We're going to be here in five minutes. Love you all.